Hi, I'm Rainy Day, and I'll be talking to you today about sexual selection for acrobatic courtship complexity and how this drives increases in cerebellar volume and body size. I want to thank Ignacio and Blake for organizing the symposium. And while prior speakers have done an excellent job of covering many mannequin basics, I'll briefly review some aspects pertinent to my talk for anyone who is just joining us or viewing at a later date. There are about 54 species of mannequins, which are neotropical sub -ossings. The majority of species breed in exploded legs, where colorful males perform a visually striking acrobatic courtship display for dull colored females. In mannequins, there's a great deal of variation in displays, and both within and between species, it appears that acrobatic courtship displays are associated with functional integration of suites of correlated traits. Many of these will have been highlighted in the symposium. And there's also evidence that females use these display traits to select males for mating. For example, we have found targeted androgen regulation, androgen expression here, that is increased when the number of wing elements increases in display within wing muscles. So androgen expression in wing muscles increases with the wing elements. But today I'll be focusing on the coevolution of overall dance complexity with neural and somatic specializations. Why focus on dance? Well, even in lowly organisms like humans, a dance move isn't just a dance move, it's a chance to judge someone's fine motor skills. Females prefer males with more complex dance sequences over males with simpler moves. Hopefully you can tell which is which here. And such complexity is associated with physical strength, prenatal androgen exposure, and symmetry. Similar associations have been found for complex courtship displays and putative measures of fitness in mannequins and other avian families. But what exactly is complex display for a mannequin? Shown here are the phylogenetic relationships, the display complexity scores, and pictorial representations of the displays for 12 species of mannequin in seven genera and the closely related Ocrebelli flycatcher. We chose these species for their similarities. They're all primarily frugivores, have legs, and, and all display, and many are sympatric. And for their differences in display complexity that across species are quite different and similar within genera, allowing us to verify both expected differences and expected similarities. In order to quantify the motoric complexity, we summed the discrete display elements and we scored the degree of male coordination, the type of arena with a cleared court getting the most points and the number of sonations produced, which were given more weight if they were produced in flight. We based our display element counts on the early ethograms of Rick Prum and added updates from the current literature as several species had received little research interest. We collect personal observations, high definition, high speed filming, and had this helped us confirm and improve the accuracy of these ethograms. And then we ended up considering, considering 41 unique elements. I should also note that our high speed analysis has made it abundantly clear that display elements given the same name, such as a butterfly flight, across genera and even within some genera are produced by different motor sequences that are not easily recognized in regular speed film. And while these pictorial representations are worth a thousand words and give you a basic idea of species that are having coordinated displays, ones that dive up, go high up in the canopy, ones that have a cleared arena, et cetera, um, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a video is worth a million, rather than me talking. So I'll spend most of the talk, the fun part of the talk, reviewing the videos that represent display complexity for most of the species we studied, and I'll highlight the novel display elements we discovered and reference our latest biomechanical studies. Then I'll return to talk about the coevolution of the brain and somatic areas with display complexity. So mannequin species, mannequin species have the most complex display, which I'm sure will have been covered in detail by other symposium speakers. Thus, I'll just remind you that of the 13 species we studied, that these ones are the most complex and that we know that females choose males on the basis of tens of a millisecond differences in how fast the beard is erected after landing. And then I'm gonna point out the little slide down display before copulation as it's gonna be relevant later on. So there's the beard being erected. And the slide down display right before the cup. Next is the red kept mannequin with a complexity score of 21. And I want to note here this unusually slow transition 
to an upright body posture with the bill in the air. As far as I can tell, the odd slowness of such a movement has not previously been reported, but let me know if you know something on this. I whistle and then cut it. The Scarlet Horn has received um, little videography, so we do confirm here what other people have observed, observed that Corneta has a wing noise that's produced at the end of the backward slide and that it's produced similarly to the metallic rub snap. Here I'm just showing um, a bit of high speed for the blue back mannequin. Emily Duvall will have shown us regular speed video for the lance tail mannequin. The Charisipia have proper displays with two to five males performing a coordinated display. And the main thing I want to note here in this next little section of video is how the high speed makes it very clear, there it is, that that hover takes a lot of intense downward wing beats to achieve that portion of the display. We recently studied um, a sister species, the swallowtailed mannequin, and attained the first high speed video of their display, which suggested the possibility of a novel mechanical sound. And Lillian Manica will show some of these videos during her talk characterizing variability in between males of these species, of this species. Next, the genus Corapipo, um, with a score of 14 and 15, is characterized by these dizzying displays remis reminiscent of hummingbird dives, with components of displays performed um, on the garden log after they go high into the canopy as a simple diagram here shows, go up into the canopy, then they plummet down onto that garden log and do a type of about face. In the video, you can hear the sound that they produce, which is described as a flap chihuahua. So there's the gar garden log and some practice displays. When the female arrives, this is usually when all hell breaks loose. You might be able to hear the high whistle and then there's the flap chihuahua landing on the log. So Alice Boyle and I have been analyzing the biomechanics of sound production in C. altera terra, and I can tell you that the display is far more acrobatic and complex than this diagram here suggests. Alice will be giving a talk providing details of our work in a complimentary session to this, session 16, talk three, so I strongly encourage you to see our talk. So here I'm only gonna provide a teaser so I, I don't steal her thunder. So this is at 100 frames per second. The flap will have just occurred. You can hear it, um, but the bird won't be in the frame yet. Then the bird comes in decelerating greatly from the dive. And as he's coming in, there's a twist right before he lands on the log. And that's when you'll hear the chi sound. And you'll notice that the little alula or our thumbs are used like rudders. Then he performs what's called a, a brani, which is a front flip with a half twist during which the wah is produced. The wah appears to be vocalization, the other two mechanical. Up. Obviously the wall. <laughs> and a beautiful butterfly flight at the end. Oops. Cut off the butterfly flight. Let's see. We're seeing again. For Clavicima, um, there were no published pathologies previously, as it had just been split from the Pacific Arena. We found that this play was very similar to that of El Serena, which is shown here in the little diagram from Perry. And we just included an additional mechanical sound. And here you can see the butterfly flight. And in a moment, you'll see that it also does that slide down the slide. There's another one. So similar to what the manicus does, but as far as we know, not like the full population. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the blue tail mannequin and Dicythia Pipra, but I'll just note that Dicythia Pipra also performed a slide down display, which is a novel finding, and that El Cornuto, the blue crown, has several elements that appear far more complex and high than high frequency than they used to. So Xenopipo atronitans has one of the simpler displays. 
This species was previously described as a dumpy little mannequin lacking display elaboration and possibly not having lacking behavior at all. We instead found that the black mannequin produces two distinct sonations, and you'll be able to hear those clearly in this track. Um, so you'll hear a snap and a, a whir um, that are produced while he's doing a little hop display. So in, in order to just be complete, I insisted that my assistant go and do some high speed filming, which he did very begrudgingly um, because it was such a simple display and he didn't think it'd be worth going out there to do. Um, but he came back extraordinarily excited because this is what he found. So first I'm gonna show you the display so you can focus on the movement without any sound. And then I'll show you um, with the sound synced. So this is at 500 frames per second. And you can see that the back flip takes less than 30 of a second to produce and is what you think is just a hop faster than the human eye can see. Here it is again with sound. And you'll also see that right before he gets to the perch, um, we've discovered he also does a, a hover display that was not known before. There's the hover. and the back step. Okay, so now we get to the really exciting part of the talk, determining if this complexity is actually related to neuroadaptations. Well, since we had previously found that the cerebellum increased in size with increases in Bauer complexity, as shown here, Bauer complexity, relative cerebellar volume, complexity in size, um, the drawings illustrate the complexity. Um, and since we had found that male gold, golden colored mannequins, this in this graph, male neuromotor advantages, have a larger arcopalium, an area involved in sensory motor processing, and almost a larger cerebellum, P equals 0.9, um, than the females. We predicted that the cerebellum, this region that's typically known for postural control, so think roadside sobriety test, and more recently found to control procedural learning, things like put on your pants before you put on your shoes. We predicted that this area would co-evolve with complexity as with the archipalium, which is a sensory motor processing area. We predicted that to control nuclei, the nucleus rotundus, which is a visual thalamic nucleus, and a subnucleus of the archipalium, which seems to be more limbic in nature, the medial ventral archipalium would not be related to complexity. So here we have a graph of brain weight and how it predicts complexity. And I'll note that we've also looked at brain volume and its relationship to complexity. So we initially measured brain mass and as shown here, found that it is positively associated with display complexity. The letters at each one of the dots indicate the first two letters of the genus and species name and the colors represent this distinct genera. Notice that this is adjusted brain um, mass, meaning that it's adjusted for the differences in the body mass between species. We also confirmed that regions involved in sensory motor processing and in procedural learning, the arcopalium and cerebellum respectively, are related to display complexity. While those control regions, the visual thalamic nucleus, nucleus rotundus, and the A and B, the less motoric portion of the archipelium, are not related to complexity. So each brain region has been scaled by its containing region such that the arcopalium and nucleus tundus were adjusted for the size of the two encephalon and the cerebellum was adjusted for the size of the whole brain, and A and B was adjusted for the size of archipalium. Note that the archipalium is archipalium minus A and B, so that these are independent variables. For brain mass in each brain region, we ran a phylogenetic least squares model that corrects for the relatedness among species, and it also gives us an estimation of the influence of the phylogeny on the traits, and we found that there was no significant influence of phylogeny on the relationship, meaning that correlation of these traits is not due to evolutionary drift. So in modeling the brain mass, we noticed some odd interactions of display complexity with the covariant body size. So we further examined these models. And what we found was actually pretty surprising. 
body mass itself is highly correlated with display complexity. Now, this might not seem that strange to many kinologists, but as far as I know, this is the only data showing that both brain mass and body mass are related to behavioral complexity in vertebrates. For hundreds of years, we have been taught that brain size must be statistically adjusted for body size, meaning that that variable is eliminated from the equation statistically. So there may be more of these out there, but everybody's been throwing away body size in these analysis. So I started thinking about why we're doing this and realized that this whole idea was based on this early notion that controlling for body mass removes the uninteresting somatic control region portion of the brain, leaving only the more interesting cognitive regions. But it's unclear what parts would even be cognitive versus which ones would be somatic. So it makes it very um, almost impossible to test whether the assumption is correct or not. And it's the idea that's even based on the fact that by taking out body mass, you somehow have an equivalent to only the somatic parts is, is just a little absurd. <laughs> the bottom line is that whether body mass has an influence on behavioral complexity is an empirical question. It should not be assumption. It should be modeled before eliminating the variable. And just to make sure, if you haven't already noticed, here's the graph here showing you the log body mass in grams and display complexity. So we also examined tarsips cubed because this is another measure of body size and found that the length of the tarsus increased with the complexity as well. So here you can see the top line is log body weight, then log bra um, brain volume, and then tarsus. So because these are so intercorrelated, um, we needed to run models to determine which ones were the best predictors of complexity, which ones um, accounted for the most variation. We used fixed effects models with two random effects, species and phylogeny covariance matrix, to answer the following questions in relationship to complexity. Which brain region accounts for the most variation? Which body measure best accounts for complexity? And which better accounts for complexity, brain size or body size? In the brain region model, the best model included all of the regions except for the leftover parts of the brain that um, were the whole brain subtracting the areas we measured. And only the cerebellum within that model has a, had a positive association. The A and B actually had a negative association with complexity. In the body model, while body mass was found to have it be an independent predictor when it's on its own, once you put it in a model with tarsus, it was redundant. So tarsus is the best predictor of complexity with body mass not providing any additional information. In the brain body model, tarsus was the best predictor, but brain mass still had predicted a unique portion of variation um, in complexity scores. In no models did the phylogenetic covariance matrix um, contribute to predicting complexity, suggesting positive selection for these traits. Okay, so what would be the functional significance of these brain region and body size relationships with complexity? Well, for cerebellum, this seems simple. This is a brain region known to support procedural learning and postural control, and it's co-evolved with increasing display complexity, presumably by sexual selection, suggesting these skills are important for complex displays. But as far as I know, no one has previously found a relationship between tarsus length and behavioral complexity to give us some indication of what, what the length of the tarsus does that allows for a more complex display. We may find for tarsus, as we have for wing bones in the past, that demand for production of specific display elements can drive adaptations in bone volume, shape, and density, as is illustrated here. So you see the shape or eccentricity core score here on the y-axis and then on x, the percent of the bones long axis. Those that do the wing snap are highlighted, and you can see that they have higher eccentricity in the middle here, and that's basically telling you that they're, they're not as round. So as the image of the bones shows, the snappers, the golden colored mannequin and the uh, white crown mannequin, both the snappers have these flattened radii. And this is thought to be for um, the highly percussive wing snaps um, so that where the wings hit together, they can um, deal with those high forces. So in addition, I want to suggest that tarsus and body mass may play differential roles in display biomechanics. And this is based on some analysis that we've completed for ceratopebra. So if you're wondering why I didn't show high-speed videos of ceratopebra in the beginning, 
it's because I was saving them for now. And what I'd like you to do is attend to the feet. So as most of you know, in the red kept mannequin, the backward slide illusion is created by a small series of hops. And we've now discovered that in the scarlet horn, the bird shuffles down the branch instead of hopping. Why might this occur? Well, Mentalis is a smaller bird. So here you can see Mentalis is 51 grams and then the Tarsus 21 millimeters compared to Cornuto, which is 18.5 grams and 22.6 millimeter length Tarsus. So it's a bigger bird um, and the bigger bird displays higher in the canopy, whereas the smaller bird displays lower in the canopy. And it seems like common sense now, but as I look at these images, but I'd never really noticed before just how the size of the bird compared to the size of the branch lines up. So much bigger bird, smaller branch, smaller bird, bigger branch. We confirmed that this um, was indeed the case for many displays and found that the branch circumference is much smaller for Cornuta than for Mentalis. And in addition, um, we thought the postures looked different as have been talked about in the literature and just quantified this confirming that the Cornuta has an upright posture, uh, much more than the Mentalis, which is almost always um, in a crouched position. Okay, so how would this be related to the fact that the bigger bird shuffles on an upright, upright on a small branch be related to mass and tarsus length. Well, first we posited that you, you've got um, a bit of um, physics going on here in that C. cornuta's large mass on the thin flexible branch might necessitate that shuffling gait to prevent resonant frequency vibrations that will result in inability to balance. And we've done some quick and dirty sort of um, equations and that suggest this is indeed the case. But we also were thinking about this in the context of how does the complexity relate to these size differences. And one of the things we first noticed was that relative to the complexity display, Cornuta in red is heavier than expected for complexity, whereas Mentalis in yellow is right on the line. However, Mentalis, again shown here in yellow, has a relatively short tarches compared to its complexity, whereas the bigger bird, Cornuta, is on the line. So we need more high speed data and we need data for more of this right of paper to start to try to tease this apart. But what is absolutely clear is that the substrate, this thin branch, can interact with bo body morphology to influence display element structure. Or I'm saying that like it's directional, but they're all interacting together. And when we look additionally at the tarsus relative to body weight for all the species, we find that the serrata pro actually have a short tar tarsus relative to body weight, while both the manicus, shown here, have uh, a longer tarsus than expected for their body weight. And while this could be gender specific, it points to the directions we should take to start to untangle these relationships, looking at the specific type of display elements that are produced and understanding the biomechanic necessities of greater mass and longer tarsus. This result also begs this question of how such a thing would evolve. How do you have these very similar displays with these just minor differences in gait evolve? And in this context, I was excited to see that Long and I are presenting a talk that seems like it's gonna be addressing what genes can produce such subtle changes in biomechanical elements, in their case, more on the muscle line, but helping us understand how you can achieve speciation in these traits. So our research is the first to show sexual selection for that sexual selection for motor behavior can drive brain size evolution, in particular, enhanced procedural learning and sensory motor control regions. These findings are important because they focus on sub opsing sub ops some awesome, got it, <laughs> adaptations for acrobatic display as compared to the much more studied awesome song evolution and provide a greater understanding of how evolution shapes neuromotor systems in vertebrates. This is also the first study to show that body size as measured by tarsus length is associated with behavioral complexity in birds and I believe in vertebrates in general. But this functional relationship to display complexity is a little unclear. We strongly suspect that we'll need to focus on specific biomechanical elements and how body mass and tarsus are pushed and pulled by each of these display characters as they seem to shift with even 
with respect to even those minor differences in gait and posture as we saw across the stratopedrum. And with that, I would like to say thanks for having me and acknowledge all of the people that were involved. They say it takes a village to raise a child and it seems like it takes several international villages to raise science. Um, so we have uh, all the Amerindian guides that helped, the Guianan assistants and logistics, Costa Rica assistants, several different labs all collaborating, and of course, people essential for the logistics and the financial support. With that, thank you for either coming or for viewing my talk. Thank you.